We've been looking at the civilization of Assyria. We've seen it uh, having been a power, it lost power, and uh, then it began to ascend once again, and it eventually was a threat to Israel over a period of years. I think the uh, next ruler of Assyria that we want to look at, here's a, a map showing the Assyrian Empire all the way down to the Persian Gulf here in Mesopotamia, up into the area that was once controlled by the Hittites, down through uh, Syria, what was uh, Israel, the other kingdoms along here, uh, down all the way into Egypt and down the Nile River. So that is the largest empire to this point. Uh, the next person that we want to look at that uh, had a part in this is Sennacherib. Oh, there's a good name for you, Sennacherib. Uh, he lived at the same time as Hezekiah, king of Judah. Uh, Sennacherib was a little more peaceful than some of his forebears. Uh, and he spent his time uh, building up the city of Nineveh. And as I said, Hezekiah was king at this point, and we'll, he'll have some interaction. Uh, there will be some interaction between them. Uh, this is a relief uh, showing Sennacherib. Uh, the, the inscription says, Sennacherib, king of the world, king of Assyria, sat on his portable throne, and the booty from Lachish passed before him. All right, so there's Sennacherib. Now, as I said, at the same time Hezekiah uh, is king of Judah, uh, Hezekiah fell between two of the worst kings in Judah's history. So his father and his son were two of the worst kings ever. Can you imagine that? How would that make you feel as a man? One of the things Hezekiah did, and he was a good king, is he repaired the temple, <clears throat> which brought about reformation in the country. So uh, in, in Judah, uh, having the temple repaired, it had been in disrepair, uh, had been fallen apart, <clears throat> it was uh, not clean, and in uh, repairing the temple once again, the people began to see that as a, <clears throat> a, a viable place to go. <clears throat> Hezekiah promoted the resumption of normal worship in the temple. Uh, he, he initiated that by keeping the Passover. That's where he started, was with the Passover. And the resulting spiritual awakening caused the people to, on their own, go out and break down the images and the groves, that is, you know, where they would have trees where they would worship other gods, uh, just to, and destroy the high places of pagan worship. So this was a good time of spiritual awakening in Judah. Hezekiah did something else that uh, may seem a bit strange to us. Uh, notice this item. He destroyed the bronze serpent or the bronze snake. Uh, any of you know what that was? You remember reading about a bronze or brass snake? Well, yes. Wasn't that like when the people got punished, they looked at it and they healed them? Yeah, what, what people were we talking about? The Israelites. Right, the Israelites and about when? Now, y'all said you read this. It was when Israel was on their way to the Promised Land. They were uh, disobedient. They were complaining about God, which they did periodically. And so God sent poisonous snakes among them that when it bit them, uh, it, it caused a great deal of pain and many people died. And so they cried out to Moses for help. Moses went to God. God said, construct a snake or serpent out of bronze and set it up on a pole. And anybody who goes and looks at the snake will be healed. And that's what happened. So, 
Jesus points to that later on in his life and says, uh, compares himself to that bronze snake. He's saying, just like Moses in the wilderness lifted up the snake on a pole, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up on a pole. We call it the cross. And just as people were saved from the snakes by looking at this bronze snake, so people will be saved by looking at Jesus on the cross, looking in faith, he means. So why, I mean, it's been around for a long time. You know, this is 600s BC. Uh, so we're talking, um, I don't know, about 1,500 years or 1,000 years or so that this snake has been around. It's not been mentioned. Ever since the time when Moses put up, it's not been mentioned anywhere. But here, all of a sudden, uh, we see it once again. And the only reason we see it is because we're told that Hezekiah destroys it. Why would he do that? He didn't like snakes. He didn't like bronze. He was jealous. Why would he destroy the snake? Now remember, he is the one that is bringing about spiritual awakening, revival, reformation in Israel. So why does he destroy this bronze snake? Did you have an idea on that? We'll let Griff give it a shot. Okay, so if you could just look at the snake, the doctors won't make any money. And he like destroyed it for financial things. And Hezekiah was not a doctor. I know, but like for his health, like he didn't make money. No. It probably didn't do anything after that one time. It was a one time deal. All right, John, what do you think? I'm going to worship him. Worship him. Not to God. You know, what happens with uh, many religious objects? Uh, pretty soon people start worshiping it instead of what it stood for. Uh, so I imagine that's what happened. That over the years, people, somebody, every once in a while, would get out the bronze snake and they would uh, bow before it. And Hezekiah didn't want anybody to uh, take their attention away from uh, the one true God, Yahweh, and be looking at a snake. And so he destroyed it. Can you see how that might happen? One of the reasons that many think that God has not allowed Noah's Ark to be uh, totally found and, and uh, picture, and, and pictured, uh, even brought down, even though several, several people have seen it up on Mount Ararat, but uh, nothing conclusive, uh, is because if we actually did have the real Noah's Ark, what would people focus on? They might focus on the Ark and not on God. There, there have been a lot of things like that. And, and what happens uh, when, we, when we get to the Middle Ages, we'll find that in the Roman Catholic Church, these kind of superstitions have grown up where people are looking to pieces of clothing or a bone or a skull of some great saint. And what are they doing? They're coming and revering, they would say. They didn't say worship, but that's kind of what it comes down to, these different items. So... That's probably what was happening with this thing. And so Hezekiah destroyed it. Get your eyes off of this material thing and get back on God. All right. Uh, the uh, death of Sargon III, and so this is before Sennacherib uh, takes over, uh, that, uh, was a sign for new uprising. So this happens periodically. When the emperor dies, that's when everybody decides, hey, we're going to break free. And so that happened when Sargon III died. Uh, and Hezekiah stood at the head of the conspirators in Palestine. Now, he was the ringleader. Uh, and that included Ascalon, king of Philistia, Merodach, Baladan, king of Babylon. Uh, the revolt was, as usual, also supported by Egypt. You know, Egypt always seems to want to get involved with any fighting against Assyria. So you've got the king over here. Uh, we've got Hezekiah here, the king of Philistia here, and Egypt. So they were joining together to fight against Assyria. 
<clears throat> Hezekiah began to prepare extensively for the coming conflict. He wanted to make sure that he could withstand any siege by Assyria. And so he began to uh, dig a, a tunnel down to the waterway of, at the uh, Siloam water conduit in Jerusalem uh, from the spring of Gihon into the city. Uh, so here's the spring down here. And he wants to be able to get water up into the city without going outside the walls. Because if the Assyrians have it all surrounded, they're not going to be able to get out. So he digs uh, a tunnel all the way down through, through rock, through solid rock, down through underneath the city, down to this pool. And it's called Hezekiah's Tunnel. It's marked in blue here. It was dug through... 1,750 feet of solid limestone. Now, one of the most fantastic things about this tunnel is that he had men start from here and dig up, and men start from the top and dig down through solid limestone underground, right? So if you're digging underground, maybe hundreds of feet below the surface, you're digging in a direction. I'm not sure how you know what direction you're going. You can't look at the stars, right? So I'm not sure how they even knew. And then to think that you're going to somehow meet up with the guys coming the other way, how would that even be possible? And yet, they did meet. They were only like a couple of feet off. That's remarkable. A remarkable engineering feat. Uh, here's uh, another drawing of the water tunnel. Here's the wall of Jerusalem. So you know, it goes down under. This is all solid limestone through here down to the spring. Here's a drawing of it today. Um, here's looking at it from the side. Here's the spring. And it is into the pool of Siloam. Here's a picture of it. I, unfortunately, we did not go there when I was in Israel, but here's somebody else going through. You know, it's a narrow passageway, but you know, there's more water came through. Well, in addition to building this to help withstand the siege, he also strengthened the fortifications of the city, and he fortified and provisioned the other cities, the central cities of Judah. <clears throat> he expanded the borders of Judah at the expense of kingdoms which had refused to join the revolt. So he attacked other kings around that refused to be on their side, uh, mainly in the direction of Gaza and Edom. So that would be uh, to the south, southeast and west. All right, in 701, the invasion of Judah uh, began from Assyria. Uh, the areas of Phoenicia, Philistia, and the cities of Judah were soon pacified. That means they're conquered by Assyria. Uh, these were 46 strong cities from which over 200,000 people were taken by the Assyrians and deported. 200,000 people. Sennacherib, who is in charge now, his armies reached right up to the walls of Jerusalem. And Hezekiah gave in. Here's a drawing or painting as someone showed of a Sennacherib's armies laying siege to Jerusalem. Oh, this is a little bit later. Sorry, I jumped ahead. <clears throat> uh, so next, Sennacherib uh, went over to Babylon, because Babylon was part of the conspiracy, remember? Destroyed it. And uh, he did so even though he felt that Babylon was a great cultural center. He felt inferior to it, but he destroyed it anyway because he didn't like that they had revolted against him. Uh, Sennacherib encountered the ruler of the Ethiopian dynasty that had taken over Egypt and forced him to flee. So Assyria ruled over Egypt as a dynasty, in, uh, an Egyptian dynasty, until it was liberated uh, a few years later. All right, so then, then we come back to Jerusalem again. 
Uh, Sennacherib laid siege to Jerusalem again in 688. Uh, his soldiers mocked Hezekiah and their faith in Yahweh to deliver him. Uh, they, and, and by the way, uh, this is part of their intimidation is uh, down here. Uh, you can see, uh, maybe you can see these guys, the soldiers are holding a pole. <laughs> can you tell what's on the pole? Can you see it? Here, here's a pole. Here's another pole. What is that on the pole? People. People. Yeah. And that's called impaling. For the person to stuck down on the pole. And this is kind of a precursor to crucifixion. Uh, the crucifixion <coughs> lasted a lot longer, as we'll see when we get there. Uh, but, so here's Here's the people marching out, being ca having been captured. Uh, here are all the Assyrians bombarding the walls of Jerusalem. You can see all the people inside that are trapped. This is a, a drawing that someone did of Sennacherib mocking the Jewish leaders, the Jewish people, Hezekiah in particular. Uh, here's Sennacherib saying to them, uh, name just one time when any God anywhere was able to rescue his people from me. What makes you think your God can do any better? That's really putting God down, isn't it? He doesn't understand who Yahweh is, that he is the one true God. He's so arrogant. He's so proud. But you know what happened? God sent a plague among his soldiers that night. Here's a a painting depicting uh, angels coming and bringing a plague upon the army of Sennacherib, drawn by Rubens. <clears throat> and uh, after being struck by the plague, they just simply got up and left and went home. Uh, Lord Byron wrote a poem about this that I think uh, captures much of what happened. Uh, look at what it says. For the angel of death spread his wings on the blast and breathed in the face of the foe as he passed. And the eyes of the sleepers waxed deadly and chill and their hearts but once heaved and forever grew still. And the widows of Asher, that's another name for Assyria, are loud in their wail. And the idols are broke in the temple of Baal. And the might of their Gentile, unsmote by the sword, hath melted like snow in the glance of the Lord. Uh, God didn't take any guff off of Sennacherib. He put them down. Well, Hezekiah was supposed to get help from Egypt against Assyria, but uh, turns out he didn't really need it because God took care of it. And Sennacherib went back home. Now it's interesting that Herodotus, who's a Greek historian, talks about this event. And uh, what he says is interesting. Uh, both stories, the biblical story and Herodotus, seems to point to the bubonic plague as what as what is, was uh, killing the Assyrians. Herodotus writes this, One night a multitude of field mice swarmed over the Assyrian camp and devoured their quivers and their bows and the handles of their shields likewise, insomuch that they fled the next day unarmed, and many fell. So uh, Herodotus points out that not only was there a plague, but the mice ate their weapons. <laughs> Or parts of their weapons, so they didn't even, couldn't even fight with their weapons. Well, 681, uh, soon after his return to Assyria, uh, Sennacherib was killed by his sons. There was a, a rebellion. Uh, one or two of his sons uh, accosted Sennacherib in the temple of the god Ninurka. 
Uh, this god, along with the god Marduk, had been badly treated by Sennacherib. Uh, Sennacherib was in the temple, apparently trying to repent or make amends, and his sons, uh, son or sons, came into the temple and killed him there. Uh, the event was widely regarded as punishment of divine origin. In other words, uh, the gods that Sennacherib had offended uh, took vengeance upon him. All right, that's Sennacherib. He's an important person to remember. And, and of course, he's in uh, All right, next, though, we come to uh, Asher Banipal. Boy, another great name. The Assyrians have great names for children. I if you have enough children to name one after each of these guys, it would be astounding. However you want to take that word. Okay, Ashurbanipal. Manasseh is the king of Judah at this time. And he joined with Ashurbanipal against Egypt. So now it's going the other way. Uh, Necho is the pharaoh of Egypt. And uh, uh, all the rebel leaders were killed except for him. Ashurbanipal uh, proceeded, though, to Egypt and destroyed the city of Thebes and about six years later. Now, about the same time in Rome, the Senate was increased to 200 members. So things are slowly becoming more civilized in Rome, they're growing. Okay, we got that. I want to move on to uh, the next king of Judah, who is Josiah. But first, here's a couple pictures of Ashurbanipal that are extant. That comes from his time period as well. Okay, let's look at Josiah of Judah. Find him in 2 Kings. Uh, Josiah's reign was the last period of greatness in the history of Judah. He began his reign as a boy of eight. What were you doing when you were eight years old? Playing with Thomas the Tank Engine. Playing what? With Thomas the Tank Engine. Playing with Thomas the Tank Engine? Okay. What else were you doing when you were eight? Jumping off of bridges. Oh, jumping off the roof. Yeah. What else were you doing when you were eight? Watching, Watching cartoons. How many of you were ruling a country? <laughs> yeah, you, uh, your misguidedness in thinking you were ruling a country probably came about as a result of you drunk, jumping off the, the roof. <laughs> uh, Josiah began ruling when he was eight years old. He ruled for 31 years. He took advantage of the decline of Assyria and worked to renew the, the kingdom of the house of David in all of Palestine. A political and national restoration was encouraged through extensive religious reformation. So again, a spiritual revival takes place under Josiah as king. Uh, the revival took place according to the following steps. First, it was the repair of the temple. Josiah, as a boy, said, we need to repair that temple and fall apart again. And while they were doing it, while they were cleaning up, while they were, they were cleaning up the rubble, somebody found a copy of the law. Nobody even knew where a copy of God's law was. Somebody found one, and they brought it to him. And uh, he rejoiced about that. And so the law had been found and began to read it to the people. And this had an effect on them. Because we know that we're told in the New Testament that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It's the Word of God that, that the Holy Spirit uses to bring faith. And so they were hearing the Word of God. And it caused a spiritual reformation among the people. And when people are truly changed, when they're truly following God, what is the result? Obedience. How do you know if someone's truly following God, if somebody's truly been changed by God? Are they obedient to God? 
Are they following him? And that's what happened under uh, Josiah's reign. And again, the obedience to the law started with the celebration of Passover, just like under Hezekiah. They started with Passover and went on from there to celebrate the rest of the sacrifices and festivals. Uh, as Josiah uh, goes away from the scene, as he dies, uh, we'll talk about his death uh, uh, later in another context. Uh, he dies in battle. Uh, Israel starts going downhill again. Uh, falls back into idolatry. And eventually, God's going to send judgment to, I'm sorry, Israel, I meant Judah. Uh, God's going to send judgment to Judah just like he had Israel. But the question comes to us, why did Judah survive so much longer than Israel? Why was Israel taken captive in 722 B.C.? And here we are much later than that with Judah and uh, in the 600s. You know, 100 years later, Judah is still around. All right, there are several reasons why Judah survived. One is that temple worship prospered. Not all the time, but especially under the rule of Hezekiah and Josiah, uh, people were coming to the temple and worshiping God. So there were times of revival, in other words. And that would be one of the other points here as well. Uh, there were revivals under Asa, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, and Josiah. We don't have any revivals taking place in the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, there's that brief time when people said, uh, when Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal, when they said, Yahweh, he is God, but that didn't seem to last very long. The people as a whole did not keep on following God. We have the influence of the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah, two big books in our Bible that are named after them to contain their prophecies. There's the unity of the kingdom because of hereditary dynasty. Do you know what we mean by that? What do we mean by hereditary dynasty? First of all, what's a dynasty? I know I've mentioned it to you before. I, I don't know that I have specifically told you to write it down or anything, but what's a dynasty? John? Yeah, the family that's ruling. So a dynasty might have two people in it because that's all the rule until somebody else comes over, or it might have 30 people. The rule right after the other. So what's the hereditary dynasty we're talking about here? The southern kingdom of Judah. What's the hereditary dynasty? <clears throat> the family that's ruling over Judah comes from whom? To whom are they related? Do you remember one of the big differences between the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah? The kings of Israel had many different dynasties, many different families ruled. As someone would get assassinated, another family would come in and take over. But the kings of Judah were all of the same family. What family was that? David. David. So one of the things that keeps Judah functioning longer stays out of judgment is the fact that they have a hereditary dynasty through David. All the kings of Judah are descendants of David. The next reason is that just from a natural standpoint, there is good geography around Judah. Uh, you have uh, the uh, Dead Sea on the southeast. You've got uh, desert on the south. You've got ocean to the West, uh, it's mountainous in, in many of those areas, and so the geography made it difficult for invading nations. But primarily, the most important reason why Judah survived is because of the sovereign determination of God to preserve David's seed. God has a plan. God has a plan back then that someday there will be a Messiah who would come from the seed of David. And so part of the reason why Judah remains as long as it does is so that that family doesn't get wiped out. So that family can continue on 
and one day produce the Messiah. All right, any questions? For your interest, at the same time that this is happening, over in India, the foundation of Hinduism, which is called the Upanishads, were composed. So Hinduism starts about this time. All right, lastly, let's come to the destruction of Assyria. Assyria's decline and fall came with great rapidity. Egypt freed itself from Assyria, even under the reign of Ashurbanipal. Two emerging rivals, the Babylonians and the Medes, contributed to the process of internal disintegration within the extensive Assyrian Empire. So in other words, the countries that are furthest away from Nineveh are beginning to uh, break away. In 626 BC, Babylon revolted and defeated the Assyrians at the borders of Babylonia. Surprisingly, Egypt came to Assyria's aid against Babylon. Probably so that they could renew their rule over Palestine and Syria. But this did not hold the tide for long. So very unusual that, that the uh, Egypt who had fought against the Syria so many times now is joining them against Babylon. I think they perceived uh, correctly that Babylon was going to be the next major ruler and so they wanted to prevent that as long as they could. So Egypt freed itself, uh, two rivals Babylon and the Medes brought about internal disintegration. Uh, Babylon revolted and defeated the Assyrians the army of the Medes conquered the city of Asher in 614. In 616, Nineveh fell before a combined attack of Medes and Babylonians. In 610, Haran was also captured and Assyria ceased to exist. It was done. There is no more Assyria. One more thing that was going on at the same time, there was a Greek philosopher scientist by the name of Thales, T-H-A-L-E-S, that at this time in um, 600s BC uh, stated that the world was round. I'm not sure that was a new thing to anybody, but it's in his writings anyway. All right, so you can see how quickly Assyria fell apart to its final destruction. And you may be thinking it couldn't happen to a nicer bunch of fellows. All right, any questions? I know there's some funky names in Assyria, uh, and, and I ask you just try to keep them somewhat straight. I'm not going to hold you responsible for seconds and thirds if, if you get the, the main name, and I won't ask you to reproduce. You won't have to spell any of them. Um, those kind of names will be uh, matching or multiple choice kind of things. But we are going to have a quiz over Assyria on Monday. We do not have class tomorrow because you're leaving early, and I have to stay here and sit in meetings. So who gets a better deal there? So you have a long weekend to uh, go over Assyria and uh, see if you can keep all these things straight. A lot of information, a lot of names. But just go over them, uh, go over them, go over them, go over them, teach them to somebody else, and you will eventually get it. Any questions?